My name is uh, Pierre Desrochers. I teach geography at the University of Toronto, Mississauga, and I make people mad about food. My wife was born in Tokyo, and we attended a talk on this very campus a few years ago where my department invited a prestigious speaker who opined that because they consume so much beyond their local food shed, uh, the Japanese are the most parasitical people in the world. And so my wife was sitting next to me, and in order not to be embarrassed in front of my colleagues, I promised her that evening that I would do something about this. And so being an economist, she insisted that we discuss the case for specializing in what you do best and trade uh, with each other. But being a geographer, I wanted to write something a little bit broader, which became the book, so which has a lot more history and concerns about uh, food security and how food is actually produced. Making a living in the countryside is tough, and you've got to be good to stay in that line of work. And the best people will end up buying the smaller operators, uh, growing their operations, developing economies of scale. And so it's a line of work like any other. I mean, the best people will stay in it, will grow, and this is how we get abundant and cheap food. People tend to forget that most of the ecological footprint of food production comes from production. So uh, heating greenhouses, irrigating fields, uh, producing and spreading pesticides, herbicides, fertilizers. There have been some studies that have shown that in North America, long distance transportation, and I mean container ships and railroad, only account for about 4% of the environmental impact of agricultural production, and uh, production per se, uh, over 80%. So in order to cut down on transportation, you actually increase the, the impact of the production side a lot more. So there are really important trade-offs there that most people are missing. So where I grew up, we would typically pick apples in September and early October. You wanted to eat them at that time of the year, fine. But if you want to eat them in April or May, then obviously you need to put them in cold storage for something like six months. There's a huge energy footprint associated with that. You have some losses uh, due to spoilage. And even though things have improved a lot since I was a kid, the taste might not be as good. On the other hand, if you import apples from the southern hemisphere, let's say New Zealand or Chile, uh, their seasons are inverted, meaning that their summer is our winter and vice versa. And they will pick their apples in March or April. So you then put them on a long distance container ship, which floats on water as very efficient uh, diesel powered engines. They reach us in North America a few weeks later and you've saved all, on all that storage. And again, the energy footprint of transportation is really insignificant. So at certain times of the year, buying apples from the Southern Hemisphere is actually the right thing to do, not only for your wallet, but also for the environment. And what people tend to forget is that these things work both ways. You go to the Southern Hemisphere at certain times of the years, and for example, in New Zealand, you will be eating Italian kiwis rather than New Zealand kiwis because again, seasons are inverted. For some reason, you talk to local food activists and they don't care where their iPad is produced or where the software that they use to connect local farmers and local consumers was designed. But somehow food is very different. And ultimately, I think it can be traced back to the fact that we put it into our bodies. And again, food has, still has this romantic aura and this idea that you really cannot trust people living in other countries. But then again, you look at life expectancy in New Zealand. You know, it's as high as ours. Life expectancy in the United States is the same. So uh, food safety standards are pretty much the same the world over. And while it is good to want to promote local economic development, I think that local food activists are way too emotional about that. And at some point, if we're not competitive producing food anymore, we should consider doing something else. And at any rate, do we want uh, Canada's 21st uh, century jobs to be apple pickers? I don't think so. What has always struck me as strange about local food activists is that their movement is all about solidarity. And yet they're making a number of victims in less advanced economies, producers who have no other way to improve their standard of living than to export what they produce to wealthier consumers in more advanced markets. And so I think the policy of local food activists is very short-sighted if the claim is, as they typically make it, that they're helping uh, address poverty issues. Well, I'm sorry, but people in less advanced economies have much more serious poverty issues than people in our economies. And if agriculture is the one way out of poverty for them, then we should not block access to our markets and to these products. The median estimates are that in the coming uh, decades, we will add about 2 billion people on this planet. We already have a billion people who are malnourished, another billion whose food security is always a bit perilous. So we need to produce a lot more food. And the problem that we have right now is that we don't have much more agricultural land available. I mean, we have some in Brazil and other locations, but we need to produce more food on less land. 
And a vital component of achieving that is producing food in the best locations for specific crops the world over. I mean, some locations are just better at growing grains than others, other at growing uh, fruits, other at grazing livestock. And again, if you want to increase food production significantly while minimizing environmental damage, then local food cannot cut it because by definition you're trying to produce all sorts of things in less than optimal conditions. So we need to uh, globalize our food supply chain even more than it is at the moment.